How's it going, everybody? Welcome back into yet another episode of Debate Night. We're back with yet another slate of great topics to talk about. We had some interesting interesting things go down uh, this past weekend and some great fan-submitted topics as well. Um, excuse me if I stumble upon my words or seem a little tired because I was out at Independence today and lost just about every um, usable cell in my body. It felt like straight sweated out my pores. Um, it's, it's gross out here. Um, Brody. I think you were I the think this is course. where I, I would like I would I'm supposed to jump in and say, "Oh, you think that's hot? Oh, you think that's hot, man? You don't know Typical. what hot is. You don't Typical. know." I Typical think that's what I'm supposed Southern to do guy. with all you cold people that love to do that when I say something's cold. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you're out there enjoying the heat. Um, couple things last last episode, few things here. Okay. Uh, Yuli will not be joining the show this week, obviously. He is in Europe and potentially him and AB, their bags might have got lost. So that will be an interesting thing. Oh my gosh, what happened Please to his bag? That their disc golf bags were oh, carry ons. What yes, happened to yes. AB's bag okay. and like all of his clothes and stuff? Who took that? <laughs> um, <laughs> so Jason, this is week number 10 of him commenting for Yuli to be on the show. It's still not going to be happening. Uh, center line pro air hockey's coming for Silas saying, Is the audio sync off? Uh, that got 16 probably, likes. So man of the people, a <laughs> lot of people saying the audio syncs probably off. People's, people's little internet. And uh, update, I am now cart gang. Oh, nice. Yeah, is that for real? I think so, yeah. Mm. I think I in this time you're now, you kind of have to. Well, let me be clear. Uh, the course is you play out in Texas. It's not um, having to do with the temperature. It has being to Being as my friendly back. as they are to cart, okay, I fair. would do it too, man. I, don't, I, think, I have no shame. I, I think my lower back might be donezo from carrying a bag. That's fair. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So makes I'm sense either well. I'm either caddy gang or uh, cart gang moving they forward. They do say once you turn well, 40, that's what happens. Gary is also joining us today. Um, looking great as always. Gary, you excited to get revenge potentially? Snubbed out of the finals maybe last time? You know what? It's all about having a short memory. It's that, it's that JJ Reddick mentality of, uh, of not remembering the shots that you miss uh, and only focusing on the next ones. But speaking of getting older, I, I just turned 34 four days ago and I already <sighs> threw my back out. This is not good. Oh, <laughs> That's what cool happens when you land in your son's playpen in a weird angle and you hop up real quick for something. Oh, and that's it. man. That's it. Night, so night. two for two on bad backs. Dustin. How's that back hanging in there? Back in good shape right now for okay. me at 33 years old. So just one year behind Gary. So I guess I have another, you know, uh, actually two months to go before that's over for me. Uh, obviously not the man of the people because Brody is the self-proclaimed man of the people. And we can only have one of those. But I was in the comments last episode I was on. There may have been a robbery of my result oh, with a shoot. guest host that took place. I didn't say it. The comments oh, okay. did. Wasn't even uh, me. But redemption for Hunter. He at least beat you so that we don't have to see you throw the shark three anymore. And I'm pretty happy about that, actually. So uh, continue mm, on. Tough. And now, then, if you um, use that as bias against me in scoring today, I will bring it up. Yeah, I'm going to start you at negative five. Gosh, <laughs> man, that made me sad so early in the show. Um, Jake's here as well. Jake the Snake. Are you also 33 of the bad back? No, no, but I will say, if we're bringing up JJ Reddit quotes, I'll bring up, is it Dion Waiters, who once said, uh, I'd rather go 0 for 39 than 0 for 9, because if you go 0 for 9, it means you stop shooting. That's how I feel with this show. I'm going to make it past third place one day. I respect it. It's going to I respect And it. if we're bringing up YouTube comments, shoot. I don't know if someone meant Trevor, but someone said, every time I start one of these, I think Jake is Isaac Robinson for a second. I don't see that as much. I think <laughs> I meant <man>. Trevor. <laughs> But. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely gotten that before, but hey, I'm, let's take a, hey, we need to get a picture of the three of us be like the Isaac Robinson triplets. It'll be perfect. <laughs> no Ezra Robinson at all. <laughs> Not related. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. Um, all right, we're going to get into our first topic here. Got to talk about Emily Weatherman. We've got a new emerging star here at FPO, maybe. Let's hear what you had to say about it. Uh, when watching M Emily Weatherman's game this season, and especially during her win in Iowa, are you seeing the potential for a dominant player? Much of her victory can be attributed to playing safe and smart golf at a time others were not, but are you seeing the tools to challenge the top of the field consistently at other venues in the future? Compare her to another past up-and-comer in the FPO division if you can. So that's kind of what I to know here. You know, obviously this course played friendly to the FPO field. You saw more bunched in leaderboard. Um, but were you seeing more than just somebody playing that smart and safe golf and kind of doing what it takes to win an FPO or you're seeing flashes of future greatness, potentially Brody, what do you think? 
Yeah, first off, really excited about this episode because I only made notes for this question because I'm going to be answering all the other ones le- uh, later after you guys, and I think you guys are all going to have terrible takes. So very excited for my rebuttals coming up. <laughs> but uh, with this one being said, there's a couple things, okay? Uh, she obviously was on tour life, so I got to talk to her a little bit, got inside her head and as far as like where she thinks her game is, where she needs to be working couple things. This course was not challenging for the FPL. This was not a course that they step up to being like, holy cow, two under is going to be a good round. They all knew they had to go low. She was playing holes out there for par. I don't think the top of tier echelon were playing any holes for par. I don't think Holland was playing any holes for par. I think if Kristen was there, she wouldn't be playing any holes for par. So right there, she already is going to be behind the uh, top tier people that can birdie every hole. Second thing though, I think the one thing that really she has going for her is her mental game. Multiple times through that final round, she would miss a really key birdie putt, whether it was on, I believe it was hole 12. She missed a really big birdie putt or late in the round when she had to make those throws, she did. And it didn't seem like playing with Missy cat merch, playing with a good crew also that were pushing didn't really face her. So the big thing for her is she's going to need to develop more distance and she's going to get a little more confidence in that forehand. Yeah. Yeah. Distance continues to be um, just the great divide in the FBO division. Sayananda. Sorry. That's my comp. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh man. Solid. I had to get it in there. I had to get it in there. I had to get it in there. So someone would be like, yes, Brody, that's a great comp. <sighs> that's mess up. Well, Dustin, you can, you can that's just, tough. um, yeah. You can say it's a great more call. elaborate on that yeah. comparison if you'd like, um, unless Gary takes it. Gary, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I think watching Emily's moments during the event, where they were great. There's something about how she throws so smooth and clean that I think you just kind of can't help but enjoy. And it's the way her her shots were kind of locked in. I also really liked her putting style, like how she engaged her wrist and had like a powerful spin um, to her putt. And it was really great to watch. Uh, I think she has all the physical tools necessary to to be competing at a high level the distance is definitely one she's got to work on the forehand as as mentioned Um, i think at this point now she just has to start developing that elite mindset which comes with time and and you could tell that she's still a little new to the level even though she hit those big putts in those big moments you could see her after her second shot on 17 was was deemed in bounds she kind of turned around and she was like super excited it was in bounds and she said that shot felt kind of iffy to her i don't think to an upper echelon player as a killer mindset it's going to be an iffy shot for them um, and you saw she was wearing earbuds, which I think helped kept her focus. A lot of play, FBO players were wearing earbuds this weekend, I noticed. Um, but it's great seeing her succeed. I think one more solid player in the FPO field is great for everybody because it gears us up for that incredible return to a united field across the board. Um, and I would say watching her this round reminded me of um, – it kind of reminded me of Nate Sexton winning the 2020 Las Vegas Challenge, someone who was playing smart golf limiting their OB, taking risks when necessary. But when you actually look at her as a player, she reminds me a lot of, if you look, go back and look at Christine Jenkins from 2019, she was the rookie of the year that year. She's a very similar smooth form in her release, and she even hitches her putt the same way. When it comes to the hot start, she kind of reminds me of Ella Hansen's hot start in 2021. Not the play style, obviously, but the great finishes and the early recognition. I think it's fair to say that we're going to keep seeing her name pop up on leaderboards. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure she'll be around. It'll be just interesting to see how high she can rise to the ranks. Um, Dustin, what do you think about Emily Weatherman so far? Yeah, so I mean, I don't think she has the skills yet to be a dominant player, but I do think she already has what she needs to be a consistent contender. And she's already proved that this season. She has multiple top 10 finishes at elite events outside of a bumpy start to the beginning of the year. Uh, But from DDO forward, she's been in five elite events and she's placed top 15 or better at all of them, except for preserve, which she came 16th. So she is showing an ability to play a pretty high level of golf in and out each weekend. Um, Also, her putting was fantastic at DMC, particularly from circle two. She was super deadly from there. Uh, Her C1X putting has been pretty good all season long for the most part, aside from like an odd round here or there. So that's definitely something she has going for her. Uh, Throwing wise, the eye test says that she has some pretty solid shot shaping with her backhand. Um, She doesn't have the distance to be, you know, up there with the elites like an Eliezer or an LR Holland, um, but she does have, you know, pretty good accuracy and has enough distance, I guess you could say. Um, So it puts her in that class of player where she has the skills to win just comes down to limiting bogeys. And and that is what she was really strong at this tournament. I think uh, the first round she had three second round. She had uh, only one in the final round. She had no bogey. She's keeping the, the disc in bounds. She's playing smart. She does have a serviceable approach forehand from what I could tell from her game. 
but she doesn't necessarily have the distance forehand to to really be you know attacking holes off the tee with it too much it seems like right now which is something maybe to work on uh there is definitely a sign not a thing that you can look at but the difference between her and size that she has a forehand side doesn't right and so that kind of puts her almost closer to like a missy gannon type character where the backhand's the dominant suit but at least she can throw the shorter forehands yeah yeah certainly helps um especially for scrambling just to have some kind of a forehand to where you're not completely handcuffed and forced to throw weird backhands when it's really pinched um jake wrap it up for us what did you see from emily weatherman what do you think about her game i think the way i would describe her game and it's already been described this way, but clean, consistent, confident. That's really, I was kind of surprised that she kept it together even down the stretch, knowing that, you know, she was making a big push for the lead because that's typically where younger players fall apart in any sport, right? Is they don't have that mentality. They don't have that experience. You know, I looked at her stats last year though, and she's pretty used to winning. I can't talk about how deep the fields were, but she had, I think 13 out of 17 wins in FPO when she played last year at her local tournaments. So she at least knows what it feels like. And, and maybe that helps her to a degree. Um, the commentary team, I think put it really well that she's mastered control of her flights, I think is the way they worded it. And I think that held pretty true. You could tell her distance wasn't comparable, but she understood her discs. She controlled shot shot shapes really well. And I think that'll help her on, you know, easier courses, like Brody said, or courses in the woods, uh, if the holes are a little shorter and, and don't call for much distance. I think that's going to be important in the future, but I'm really curious to see if she takes a lead, will she be able to hold off a charging Kristen Tatar? How will she handle that threat? How will she handle that pressure? Especially being on lead card, if you're all eyes on you, you're maintaining that lead. That's a different pressure than coming back from third place and just playing your game and, and kind of drifting and seeing where it takes you. Um, so I'm interested to see, you know, if she gets in the hot seat again, how she does and if she shines through, cause if she does, she'll be dangerous. She'll be dangerous for a while. Yeah. I, I think, um, good bro. Do you have something to add? Yeah. I just wanted to add one thing. The, the thing that kind of makes me feel like she's a little bit different than other players in the FPO is she's not, I don't think she's actually a sign with anyone this year. No, I don't um, think so. She yeah. pretty much told me like, I don't need money to make it through the rest of the season. And I really like where my bag is right now. And the other thing too is respect that she had a very young age. Like she, I think she started playing, I believe uh, junior 12, I think is where it was. Yeah. Junior 12 is when she started playing and she like wanted to become a professional disc golfer at a very young age. So she's like in this new crop. We haven't seen too many. I mean, I guess Ellie Ezra might be in yep. there too. But she's in this new crop of like, this is my career path. I want mm -hmm. to be the best versus there's a lot of people right now in FPO and MPO that are like, oh, I just get to go around the United States and play disc golf and it's really fun. And like, yeah. I'm able to like pay my bills and play disc golf. Like, I think those two mindsets are completely different. So totally. she is someone that I could see her trajectory, not like plateauing and her yeah. continuing to push and get better and better. There's definitely yeah. a difference in those who like grow up with that m mentality of like, this is the pinnacle of what I want to achieve as an athlete versus somebody who maybe falls back on disc golf. You know, I'm not to throw you on the spot, Brody, but like a lot of, a lot of other athletes have fallen on disc golf as, Hey, this is a way I can play a professional sport, make money. Um, but it wasn't my first choice. Whereas, yeah, that, that it's a difference just in, your the way you're perceiving your career and, and touring when it has been your entire objective um, well, it's also too hard to make that switch of like if you were just like oh i can just play disc golf for a couple years i'll see where i'm at you know i can just go from a tiers to a tiers and whatever this is kind of cool and then all of a sudden like a flash in the pan there's actually real money involved things are getting really serious now it's like okay well do i flip the switch to where now it's like yeah. oh now i'm going all in or am I still going to be the person that like goes on nature hikes and like looks for rocks and, you know, <laughs> you know, go to national right. parks, like that kind of thing. Right. Like, I think it's also two different things. It's also the situation that we, I think we kind of talked about in the past where it's like, if you are uh, an FPO player, your ability to play other professional sports is more limited, right? There is no professional softball per se. There, yeah. there is a totally. limitation even on professional mm -hmm. volleyball. Like, yeah, there is yeah. like a, a beach tour, but there's not like court volleyball kind of ends after the Olympic stage. So those types of athletes, you know, are looking for something else to funnel their efforts into and then disc golf can be that option. Pro disc golf as a, as a female athlete is enticing. Missy Gannon has mm -hmm. made $38,000 
as of before the Des Moines event in earnings, mm -hmm. not counting anything she's made from selling discs. And like there is, there is money to be made, and um, it's definitely very enticing. Um, all right, we're going to see FPL grow as well. Just at the end, like yeah. her and Ellie yeah. are both rookies, and they went one two at this event. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's 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 exciting to see new players. I think it'd be interesting to see how many of them can not just be a flash in a pan and, and really realize um, higher potential. Um, all right, we're going to talk about Anthony Barella and Gannon Burr because they just continue to put on a show this year. So they continue their duel for Player of the Year with AB getting an important fourth victory, fourth victory already this season to get back on track. With three majors yet to play, however, which player other than those two is most likely to grab one or more of them to throw a wrench into this two-horse race? And with just one major and, let's say, a Pro Tour win, be enough to top AB's four wins or Gannon's three. So this is kind of a, a bag of worms. We've been opening a bunch this year, but I think that the, the more wins we get into the season and especially with the majors still in play, there's so many more possibilities because when it was like, okay, they have two wins, they have two wins, they have one. It was a little easier, but the, I mean, we're talking about four wins, three yep. wins with elite pluses. And there's all these majors on the table there. Now all of a sudden it's getting so hairy. Then you have the average finishing place. So I want to get your take on all of that. Um, Gary kind of unpack your predictions here based on that prompt. Sure. I think you can break down an answer to a question like that into a couple of different categories. Because the first, you've got the players who, who have the skill set to win, but they have some consistency issues. Adam Hammes is one of the first ones that comes to mind. You know, he blew a big lead at the Majestic, and he just couldn't hang on this weekend. Um, Paul McBeth is another one who has a uh, honestly a pedigree of winning and dominance, but he's not stringing entire events together right now. And I'm also thinking about Ezra Robinson, who keeps putting himself in the mix. We keep seeing him on coverage, but he collapses with his aggressive play in front of the finish line. It seems like a lot. Then next, you have the players who have the big they're the big threats you got ricky wysocki you know the man hungry to end his streak uh his major drought and uh, he has a win this year so blood's in the water you got nicholas antala matty o's one that comes to the top of my mind because he's heating up at the right time i feel like he's just a, a few holes every event away from winning and he's one of the best momentum players disc golf has right now and then simon lazat if the putt's on it's going to be great but he has some issues with with um you know, majors. But the true final boss to this whole thing is Calvin Heimberg. Uh, this man needs a major like nobody else does. He's he's better at events that have more rounds. So if he can shake off the jet lag, I think he's the biggest opponent to AB and Gannon down the stretch of these majors. At this point, I think one pro tour and one major would be enough to challenge Gannon, but I don't think it would be quite enough to challenge AB, especially now that AB's won at different times during the year. It's not just front loaded at the beginning of the season. Uh, see, I'm I'm rooting for madness. I think AB is going to get the European Open now that whole 16 isn't so scale and that Calvin is going to get his first, his first world. And I think we're going to have a first time ever USDGC winner this year. <laughs> yeah, they did ruin whole 16. Um, now, you made, you made a good point there. The, you know, bringing the season together with a win later on in the year instead of just having it, it's it's huge. It's monumental because now you can't just write them off as a hit at the beginning of the season. Now we have something to connect to the end of the season um, as well. Uh, Dustin, what do you think? Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, there's a, like a lot of small questions kind of wrapped up in this. I'm going to try to uh, kind of pick it apart a little bit. So I do not think that one major win is enough to top what Gana has achieved consistency wise this year or the four wins that AB has gotten this year the only exception would be if someone like heimberg or ab was the one getting the major one because they're already kind of in striking distance and that could tip them over the edge i mean burr has three wins six additional top five finishes only one finish outside the top 10 um so yeah i just don't think one major win does it or it doesn't trump four wins for maybe now uh, a player with two major wins will be in consideration, just like Isaac Robinson was in consideration last year. But then you're going to run into the same debate that happened last year when you had Calvin Heimberg, because Calvin Heimberg just stayed super consistent. He had enough wins to be in the conversation, and his overall average finishing place is what took them over the line for a lot of people when it came to the player of the year argument. You either went one way or the other. Did you value the majors more? You went with Isaac. If you value consistency more, you went with Calvin. I think the same thing could kind of happen here with the Gannon Burr and what he's been able to achieve so far this season versus whoever picks up a couple of majors or something like that, if it were to be that way now as far as the players that had the best chance to attack these two players in this race right now between ab and gannon it really depends on if ab and gannon slow down or not they continue to rack up a couple of wins each 
it's going to be very hard to do. Uh, Calvin obviously is the closest because he already has two wins and he has a pretty solid season outside of like a couple of shaky finishes. And then Ricky would really be the only other one. Now, Macbeth would be interesting because he is strong at the European Open historically and he designed one of the courses that's going to be played at World. So like there is a theoretical world where he wins two majors and he gets in the argument. Um, but yeah, I would say likely Ricky or Calvin would be the most likely challengers. Yeah, definitely uh, doesn't become nearly as interesting uh if they proceed to continue winning events and then just can build that win total up five, six, seven wins. Um, Jake, how are you seeing this player of the year race shape out here? Yeah, I think if you had asked me a few weeks ago and I, I think we did, I think this question was on when I was on Probably. a few weeks ago, I would have said Calvin and I would have felt pretty confident that he was really the only, um, contender outside of AB and, um, Gannon, excuse me. But right now, I think the tiers are Gannon and AB at the top, Ricky and Calvin now, too. And then I think everybody else would really have to put on a show at the end of the year, and I, I just don't feel confident about that. I think this year, and in the past couple of years, more than ever, we're starting to see that consistency is very difficult to achieve. And I think that's going to hurt AB if Gannon can win a major, if Ricky can win a major and an elite series, or if Calvin can win a major. I think you know three wins, if one includes a major, is better than four wins, but an inconsistent season too. Um, or even two elite series wins in a major. Um, I just think consistency is really important right now. I think Gannon has the consistency. Ricky has had the consistency and Calvin has, um, I like Ricky for this. Ricky needs major wins. And I think he knows his clock is, is ticking. You know, he's getting older, just still pretty much in his prime, but you know, he probably sees Macbeth falling off and, and realizes there's, there's a time limit on all this. So I think he's going to come out of the, the second half of the year hot. He's going to try to get his major. He's going to try to get more elite series. And with the consistency he's having, I think this is his. Um, yeah. But, you know, I still think Calvin is heavily in play here, too. It is definitely interesting that the two players that seem to come to mind here are the two that seem to not be able to win a major um, at the moment, at least. Um, Brody, you had to hear everybody's responses. What are you gathering? Which were supposed to be all bad. So let's let's see it. <laughs> well, not that. this question is not really one that you can not get bad, too wrong. Yeah, this one you can't really get too wrong with your with your answers. Um, I I like I kind of agree with Gary. I like Matty O as a dark horse pick here. Um, I'm watching. You know, the more I watch of this guy, it really seems like he just needs to get over the hump. He should have won this tournament. The first four holes, you want to be at least two under or three under through the first four. He was even par and he lost by two. So like, it almost seemed like once he was like, all right, I can't win it. Right. Cause AB started four under and he started even through the first four. So he was like, all right, I'm not going to win. Then all of a sudden he started playing phenomenal. So it's almost like he needs to just, he needs to flip a switch or something. Uh, because even when he was talking about his MVP win, uh, I think recently this week he was talking about it. Like he did, he had no idea. He wasn't paying attention to scores. He had no idea that he was winning or that he was about to win. So it's like it's almost like he needs to put blinders on and act like no one else is in the field and just go out there and play. So I'm I'm with Gary. I think someone dark horse is going to win a major, and I think one of the top five guys. Don't forget about Eagle. No one said anything about Eagle, which I find kind of surprising. Uh, I think he's going to be one of the favorites to win this European Open. Yeah. 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 But, Eagle's going to be interesting. To, to give some insight on Matteo, because I know I'm pretty well. He lives in my area. Um, he is of the old school mindset. Uh, we go to the same grocery store. No, I'm just trying to say that. I, I have a little bit of insight no. talking to him. Um, <laughs> he comes from the era where it was about cashing to stay alive on the road. And so I do think for a long time, his mentality was try to make as much gas as possible because he wasn't getting that huge guaranteed, you know, salary when he was playing back in the day for latitude or prodigy or whomever things have kind of changed now with West side. I think that was huge for him. And that's why he's been able to focus a little bit more on winning, but I do think you're right. I think it is, it is a big mentality shift for him to go for cashing and surviving to like, no, let me risk it for the win. Well, um, that he, he said that before when we had him on the pod, he was definitely. literally saying like, there's no one better than making top tens than me. Like mm -hmm. he knows that's his MO and he needs to like, he's like one of those guys that needs to snap out of it and be like, I'm either, I'm either winning this tournament or I'm getting 20th, not I'm playing for a top 10. And yeah. um, you guys were kind of talking about some of these like finishes and stuff. You start looking at this and it's like, you know, 
37th place, right? You would say, ah, that's not really that great. But like you shoot a couple more under par in your top 25. Yeah. And like that's a decent finish. You shoot, you shoot four more under par and your or five more under par and you're uh, almost top 20. So it's like these fields are getting so stacked. And this also wasn't even a completely stacked field. They're getting so stacked that that's one thing we are kind of forgetting sometimes is we kind of just go back and be like, how many top tens do they have? And it's like sometimes like they got, you know, 12th and they were just, they were literally one shot out of a top 10. Like they were right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, but I'm with you guys on, I, I think you got to look at the wins at the end of the year. And if someone has an insane amount of wins, it doesn't really matter what else they do the rest of the season. Yeah. That is an I interesting, was, I was just saying that's an interesting tidbit yeah. to the uh, whole podiums conversation and the top tens and, you know, and average finishing place at the end of the day is what it is. Like it's impressive what Gannon's done, but a lot of times people don't understand that, 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 35th place or whatever that we might look at as a blemish on somebody's resume comparing them to Gannon might have literally just been a couple of shots. And when you think mm-hmm. about it that way, it's like, what does that matter? Like that might have been the difference between them thinking, I'm going to try and play these last couple holes aggressive and you drop a few yeah. shots. Like that, that has nothing to do with with their play as a whole for the season and in, in the scheme of this award, in my opinion. I think also <laughs> Calvin would have been like, there wasn't, there wouldn't even been a question about player of the year last year if Calvin's win. Uh, wins were at the end of the season. So mm-hmm. that's something too to look at is uh, kind of like what Gary and Dust everyone was alluding to. If they keep winning throughout the season, it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. Uh, but if yeah. someone else goes on a tear and wins a couple at the end, people are going to remember those more than the ones at the beginning. It's of the always season. about stamping what the season. Is if Preston wins another about. major somehow and he has two yeah. majors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody brought like, that name up. In, yeah, and you have to put him in the argument <laughs> all of a sudden. Depending on if, tr- <laughs> if Dan and, and AB were to slow down. That would also be <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I, what, what would be Preston's best chance at a major? Mm, probably European USDGC? Open. USDGC? USDGC, is he going I to think, Europe? Yeah. It's got to be USDGC, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I He's would not say European Open. Though. I've seen him on. I don't board. think it's USDGC. I think I, I think, think it's probably Europe. I think that's his best chance, though. It'd be USDGC as far as like his game style. USDGC yeah. though, Europe you need big forehands. Like Europe, big. Here's forehands. the thing about USDGC though is like randos don't really win. You, are you saying you need big forehands to win in Europe? Well, you need no, them to I'm win in USDGC. Helps. It helps. It helps. <laughs> yeah. Well, it helps to both. I agree. It helps Here's the thing: both. He's not going to win either. Okay, clip that. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. That was the that's clip that. Clip that Presnell and play that every morning. Sorry. Use that for motivation. Andrew for Prez. Yeah, it is. Um, anyways. Okay. We're gonna move on to our next topic. We got fan <laughs> we got fan submitted topics now. Brody's favorite part of the show. And let's see if we can have a new winner for dumbest question ever asked. Um <laughs> I did not I see don't that think so. in the comments last Well, week. maybe the last one here, but this one probably not. Um, so this question from a fan was, is the Disc Golf Pro Tour too reliant on the Disc Golf Network subscription money? Um, and I guess if so, where should the Disc Golf Pro Tour's main income streams come from? They want to know. Are they too reliant on those subscriptions? Are they just sitting on, sitting fat on the subs? Um, Dustin, what do you think? Well, with the product like the Disc Golf Pro Tour, the best way you could make money is by selling a broadcasting rights deal, which they tried to do that with Jomez, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the bottom line is that the subscription model is a guaranteed income, and it is the norm right now for them, and it makes them apparently enough money to allow them to operate uh, just the, what they have right now. So, yes, in a sense, they are relied upon it. Do they have other revenue streams? Yeah, there's advertising dollars, there's sponsorship dollars, you know, there's there's activation dollars. You know, we see it at chess.com, you know, we saw it with, um, you know, Barbasol in the past. So, like, there are other avenues, but yeah, it is a big part of it. I think the issue, though, that they have right now at the subscription models, this tier system is ridiculous. I mean, I really don't get it. Like, the basic plan for $6 is practically worthless. I know you get it for free if you're a PDGA member, but what it offers is just not a good value deal. And so it pushes you into that $12.99 spot to be able to get full live access coverage for the entire season. And that's a pretty sizable amount of money for the product that the Disc Golf Pro Tour is in comparison to some other products that you could buy for that price in the streaming world. So, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely one of those tough things. Um, the option would be to go to a free streaming model where you therefore increase the viewership. But the problem is, are you actually going to get enough viewers for it to matter when it comes to trying to sell broadcasting rights, when it comes to selling advertising and sponsorship deals? Or, or are you going to find other ways to monetize that audience with products or, or partnerships, or whatever the case may be? I don't really know what the answer to that question is. I don't know what that number has to be for it to happen. I think you also have to understand they are in debt. 
right? I mean, basically their acquisition of Gemesis is debt forgiveness. So they didn't get any money from that deal. That's a lot of money lost and a lot of money lost in legal costs, by the way, from last year. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, that is the kind of the catch 22 with uh, the free model is like it's really jumping off a cliff there and seeing if you could make the money back. Um, Jake, what do you think about their current system? And are they too reliant on that subscription money? I don't think too reliant. And the only real information I could find on this in general was an interview with Jeff Spring, actually, where he said the four uh, revenue streams are sponsorships, partnerships, advertisements, then viewer subscriptions, then retail merchandise, and then ticketing. Um, but yeah, I mean, he brought up a point at the end of that. With all that in mind, the Pro Tour has yet to break even. And I think that's still true today, even though this is from back in 2022. We can't control advertising and promotions nearly as much, but I think the one common denominator here is kind of growing more of an in-person um, attendance to these events, right? We've seen some scattered U.S. attendance this year. It's much better in Europe, but I really liked what they were doing for a while with trying to bring other events and other happenings to a Disc Golf Pro Tour stop. Right, bring in a concert like a Corey Wong, but you know, try to get some big names, get people to come out, bring their families, bring friends, introduce them to disc golf, and then start to get them on the retail side and on the on the ticketing side of the in-person events. That will grow the sport. That will kind of shorten that gap between players and fans. They'll get to watch their favorite uh, players play. I think that'll drive them more to the subscriptions because, I mean, just to come back to the original point, I do think they rely on subscriptions, but until the sport grows that's really the only place they're going to see uh, the best return so as long as they they focus on growing the sport and i think drawing more people in person in the us and making it accessible um i think that should be their focus yeah going yeah forward. definitely um in-person growth definitely needs to be a big thing that's that's a huge thing that they're lacking right now um brody what do you think yeah it did take long question number two absolutely no to the concerts please no to the Corey wong uh, I hope they did not pay that guy. Uh, I was at one of those events. There were 20 people there. Um, that is not the answer. That is that concerts and disc golf don't make any sense. Um, I say blow the whole thing up and let's oh. just completely start over. Okay. Let's just go pay-per-view per event pay-per-view. Don't give me all these documentaries. Don't give me all this other stuff that you have. Don't make the website super difficult. Like I have to click four different things to get to the live. Don't do any of that. Literally make it as simple as possible. I click a button and now I'm watching. Boom. There it is. Coverage. If you want to have extra streams to be like, hey, if you want to just watch, um, you know, 80% of the time, nothing and then the other 20% of the time, there might be someone throwing a Frisbee on this hole. If you want to do that and you have another stream, that's fine. Blow it all up. First, better commentary because right now, I, I'm going to be honest, commentary is really bad majority of the time. So I'm either muting it or I'm just like, I'm just going to wait for Jomez to come out so I don't have to listen to this. Um, I would say that. And then the last thing to do, give the first 15 minutes for free every day. First 15 minutes go free. That way you get people to watch and be like, oh, wow, I'm not a subscriber or I didn't pay for this pay-per-view. And then they pay for it. Um, okay. Well, that was a great critique of the Pro Tour Network. Not really answer the question per se, but good critique of the network. Um, <laughs> Gary, I what are your thoughts? Question. Huh? I answered the question. Mm, that's debatable. Debate night. Okay. Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts? I don't think we have a good understanding of where their current earnings are coming from, but we can make some loose assumptions about some previous years. Uh, the DGP stated in 2022 that its subscription count skyrocketed to nearly 50,000 subscribers, which seems like quite the influx of money. And it was also reported that attendance was at an all-time high. And like um, Jake said, that Jeff Spring was interviewed at the end of 2022, and he said despite all that, they have yet to break even. And even though they also added more than a million dollars to event purses that year, which is a big place the money went to. And he said it, it, four sources, sponsorship and ad sales, viewer subscriptions, retail merchandise, and event ticketing. And if we're asking where the, in, the income should come from, it's not event tickets. It's not merchandise. Those are sprinkles on top of the cake. They don't get you to the next level. It's got to be subscriptions and sponsorships. Subscriptions have a really slowly moving ceiling because market spending sensitivity makes it really hard to, to charge consumers more for things. 
and there's only so much they can do in that arena. So sponsorships, though, are they're kind of like an unlimited well that you can go to, and if you draw from it carefully, you can get what you need need financially. But there's one problem, and that's the best way to get sponsors is to get more eyes on the sport. And the best way to get more eyes on the sport are either to improve the product or to lessen the financial burden for viewership numbers to increase. But the problem is if you lose money on subscriptions, it takes away from the operating fund, makes it harder to make the events better, and it creates like an Ouroboros situation where the snake is eating its own tail. So what I think they need to do is just continue to leverage the sponsorships that they have, hunt some new ones, chess.com, great, Microsoft Teams, great, improve the product to drive viewership, find a financial model that makes sense for the viewers. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, Brody, go ahead. Yeah, one additional thing. Uh, I was actually a part of the pro am on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much they charged people for that. There was it was me, Gannon, A B, and Cole, I believe, were the four people. And we had each had four people on our card. So 16 people total. Huge success. Everyone had an absolute blast. Everyone absolutely loved it. So Disc Golf Network, Disc Golf Pro Tour, if you're listening to this or someone that knows someone, if you're listening to this, stop having people pay for practice rounds where they literally just watch players practice and ha- and do this Pro-Am thing. This Pro-Am thing so, is, is, is a win. Yeah. What I just heard you say was that bridging the gap between players and fans and having more events at the actual Disc Golf Not Pro Tour. Not a concert, is, Jake. No one wants I, to I was just using that wall. as an example. I'm <laughs> saying let's bring people, let's get them just entertained. You know, <laughs> like people go to baseball games, football games all the time, and it's entertainment for them more than sport. Granted, the diehard fans and the players are there for the sport, but they bring their families because it's entertaining. It's fun. Let's make it fun. Hey, you're not wrong. I I, I, I think the pro am side is big. Um hmm. But yeah, most of you said it. It's it's this weird balance between, okay, if we make the product cheaper, we lose money, we maybe gain more eyeballs. Can we convert that into more sponsorship? It's a really weird balance. But as most of you kind of alluded to and know, the money in the sports world comes from the TV deals and the advertising. That's where it comes from. But we don't have um, the viewership now, for that. Yeah. And now I will say yeah. that um, the there's a lot more to be made out there Um from in-person spectating if they could take advantage of that but is that something that disc golf is ever going to really thrive off of tough to say Um, but if but if you can and there's a lot of money to be made off of that but Mm -hmm. yeah it definitely has to come from the viewers and it's tough to say what the right uh, route to choose is because you feel like right now you see a pro tour that is in a bit of a box financially and can't afford to try new things you know as far as their model and their pricing but at some point they might have to take a risk and we'll see what happens well they well, needed they did take smart risks right they need like put up put up at the beehive or whatever put up like a tent that doesn't cost that much to get access into it's a little bit extra money something like that because you know if they do end up paying uh, uh you know a hundred thousand dollars for a carrot top to come out and do a 30 minute show <laughs> And no one shows up and it doesn't increase tickets or anything. That's terrible. So they almost need to figure out what is like super cheap for them to do, but actually brings value to the consumer and makes more people want to show up. Well, and the interesting thing too, is you have to cater to your audience. If you ever see minor league baseball, uh, for example, they're like the masters. A lot of them are the, the masters of fan experience because they have to, they have to make it a show to get people to come watch double a baseball. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing that's unique about a tour versus a team is a team can cater very specifically to their fans. They see the same fans, you know, week in, week out, they know their area, what they like. Hey, we've got a local food truck that everybody loves. We'll bring that to the game. The tough thing with a tour is your environment is changing every single week. You're going to a new place with new fans that you have to appeal to. So someone might love so-and-so concert. Somebody might, some other area might hate that. So, you know, they might not like that at all. So that's the, that's the challenge with the tour is you have to, you know, make an effort at each place. And and that's why it's the, the key is having organizers at a local level that can really care and put effort into an event and can work fl- like fluently with the pro tour to, to create that experience. You know, that's, that's what it comes down to at the end of the I day. I think another cool thing, by the way, real quick, is like mm-hmm. activations at non-disc golf things. Like I think this disc golf stuff that they do at Bonnaroo is actually pretty sick. And and then it's about then converting people who learn about disc golf into disc golf viewership. So, yeah. I mean, that, that's the two other items you could maybe look at. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. I, I like what they did a lot with 
the chess.com stuff, I was really surprised. I was skeptical at first, but like to see what they did to the course. And when I saw Magnus Carlsen there, That's that, was awesome, a, yeah. that was a really, really cool moment for, for people who knew who he was. And oh, yeah. I think they said they're going to be doing something kind of in the reverse where disc golf goes to support chess at some point. I'd love to see what that's going to look like. Um, but yeah, we got to get past a point where the sponsorships are coming from people at organizations who happen to play disc golf. Like, yeah, Microsoft teams yeah. Certainly, certainly. Um, all right, we got one more fan submitted topic here for our final topic. Um, this fan wanted to know: Would a way to add some more prestige slash uniqueness to World to be to play it on a twenty-seven hole course? This would separate itself from the other three majors, with USDGC being the major with lots of OB, European Open being in Europe, and Champions Cup being ideally the wooded major. <laughs> ideally, um, a great way to make Worlds its own thing could be the length in the course, opposed as opposed to adding more rounds. So, what do you guys think about this take? Obviously, Worlds has flirted around with the round structure more often um they've also done final nines in the past um but what about a 27 hole course how would that play out jake what do you think at first i was like oh this is an interesting idea but i quickly jump ship off that you know worlds last year was five rounds uh, that's a lot of disc golf and playing around each day i mean that probably helps what we just talked about with revenue right biggest tournament of the year you want to play as much disc golf as possible but i think you can only do that to an extent you know, I'd rather see tournaments where each throw and each hole is critical to score well and, and critical to doing well. And each hole has a lot of worth. If you're playing 27 hole rounds, um, you know, then you're only playing maybe three rounds total. I'd rather see it spread over five days, a lot of variety. I think each or maybe I think it was four out of the five days we had an, or three out of the five days, excuse me, we had a new leader at Worlds last year. And that's exciting. Right. I want to see players have to execute on each hole. It can come down to a stroke or two. Last year, I think the top 10, there was a difference of six strokes between first and 10th at Worlds. I think that's what's exciting. So expanding it out to 27 holes in a round, it's just either more golf per day for less days or more golf across five days. And, and I just don't think players are built for that. And, and I just think it's going to cause too much separation potentially. Um, players should have to execute, have to perform their best to win it all. It's the most prestigious tournament for a reason. I don't think we have to change the the round length to make that or to maintain that. Yeah, fair enough. All right, Jake, not on board with the idea. Brody, what are your thoughts? I think yeah. I know where you're going to be headed. Terrible idea. Terrible idea. Um, we got to try to figure out how to make this product quicker, not longer. I mean, we just played on a very short and quick course rounds that were three plus hours three and a half hours something like that where i think me ezra tristan and goose did a practice round filming talking to the camera and i think we almost played the entire course in like two hours so that just shows you how long these tournament rounds are extended with no with no entertainment going on for the people on the ground. So terrible idea. Um, I'll say this easiest way to make world stand out and be different. It's the only major that you play a wooded course and an open course. You got to have both skill set. Uh, other thing, make it to where only the top hundred players in the world get invited. Hot 150 get invited, 200 get invited, make it some sort of, if it's going to be called worlds, Make it something worth the world rankings is how you get into the tournament and then make it every other year. Make it something that we haven't seen it in a while makes us really earn for it. if the Olympics happened every year, it would not be as exciting as it is now. Like we haven't seen, I haven't seen curling in four years. <laughs> I'm ready for curling to happen in a couple of years from now <laughs> because I haven't seen it in two years, but you get my gist. I haven't seen anyone run the hundred meters in a while. I'm ready to yeah. see if Noah Lyles can do it. So make it every two years and have, have yourself a ball. I actually like that take a lot. I would be, I would totally be down for a every two years or every three years or whatever major. I think that'd be exciting. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts? I'm so pumped for curling. Um, I'll make a few things clear real quick. I, I, I like that we're trying to come up with something unique, and I like that we're trying to make majors iconic, but it's always been my opinion that Worlds should just be a collective challenge to all skill types. Um, by moving the venue and balancing the use of different courses, we're accomplishing that already. Some places do it better than others. Um, but I'm really excited to see what they do this year with the balance of New London and Ivy Hill. I think it's going to make for a great Worlds. Um, and this is... a there's some problems with this idea. Let's, let's talk about that. Uh, we don't 
really have a lot of venues that can accommodate a 27 hole layout that would have to cause some drastic changes. That's an infrastructure problem. Uh, one other big issue that we can see is if you just turn and look to the Minnesota Majestic that happened two weeks ago, I know I referenced it twice. Look at that. Um, they did 26 holes in round one and 21 holes in round three, and they had a massive rampant pace of play issue. At one point they had the lead card on hole 14 and the chase card on hole 20. Uh, that's a serious operations oh, problem. Yeah. So you have an infrastructure <laughs> problem, an operations problem. Also, daylight's a general concern. That's an astrological problem. They can't do anything about that, though. <laughs> um, you, you know what worlds really could have to be unique? The prestige of being worlds. Um, you know, being the world champion needs to mean something really special. The challenge has to, to, to be for multiple skill sets. If the USDGC is OB, the European Open is overseas, not unique next year because of Worlds, and Champions Cup is wooded, not unique next year because of Swenson Park. Let's make Worlds <laughs> the mastery of all three of those things. Let's get that fully figured out before we start messing around formats. Yeah, a lot of, lot of things really shifting in the identity of these majors next year. Um, Dustin, are we going to get a pro 27 holes pitch here? No, definitely not. I mean, 27 holes is way too much, especially if we're going to do it for five rounds, like which has been the norm kind of lately for Worlds as far as how many rounds gets played. I've always thought that if you have enough room to make 27 holes, you probably have enough room to make 18 really good holes instead of having 27 holes where some of them are probably going to be dinkers and fillers. And I just don't really like that type of idea usually. Um, kind of like what some others have said, and, and so I hate to reiterate it, but if you are going to make Champions Cup eventually the wooded major, if it gets back to a wooded course, if you are going to have USCGC and European Open kind of have their single courses and what they're known for then yeah i do think that worlds being the two course major where you get a balance of wooded golf you know ob open golf things of that nature it is going to test an entire skill set now you can either do that with two courses or if you can somehow find a one course that somehow just does it perfectly throughout all 18 holes, like some dream property that you can build on like a new unique piece of land that somehow is perfectly tailored to like testing every single shot shape or something like that across a round of 18 holes and sure i guess you go that route instead of going the two course route and i think what we're going to see between new london and ivy hill is indeed going to be that opportunity with worlds this year although obviously next year when it goes over to the european open courses it's it's going to kind of revert back to kind of an old thing so yeah i think outside of that adding uniqueness and in, in prestige comes from having a massive purse coming to how you broadcast it the content you put around it um, you know, having historical figures be a part of it. You know, there's a lot of things you can do to make the broadcast and the environment super special to make it feel like a big thing. Yeah. And you know what? You mentioned another good one um, at the end there that would work, which is um, I'll give you I'll give you a bonus point for it because it was one that I thought of. Um, the largest purse thing is like right now, the largest purse we get in our sport is the tour championship, yep. which like a lot of people don't even watch. Um, and the reason the same for golf. Right, right. I, I think it's. I just think it, it's interesting that the the way that it's structured right now leads that way because you know, and I think part of it's obviously you have the PDGA getting behind Worlds and the Pro Tour behind its own agenda, right? So they're not even on the same page. But if I was the Pro Tour and Worlds was in my control and I wanted to be like, okay, how can I give this an identity? I would just protect that purse as the largest purse. I think it's a that's a really easy way to make a tournament prestigious. It's like this one bonus card you get to throw out in your season. Say, I can make any event matter more than it normally would because it's going to have the most money. And right now they spend it on the Tour Championship, which is fun fine it is what it is but that's where they're kind of spending that little bonus point there is is on the tour championship whereas I, they could do it anywhere i do think that might be a quick fix though because as the money gets bigger money talks no, no one no no one cares as yeah okay no, we can fix it in 50 years no, no but i'm saying that is a, <laughs> i'm just saying that is a quick fix right now to make something important i'm just saying like that doesn't yeah, really I mean, make a thing more uh prestigious or anything down the road when we're talking about oh every tour stop the winner gets 1.2 1.8 million but at this one you get 3.6 or 4 I, I to me like as a sports fan if i'm watching tennis golf or anything like that that's fair point i don't really i'm not looking up to see like oh should i pay attention to this one because of how much money they're getting that's a fair point. Fair maybe, point. Maybe that's a that's part of the long term play with the, the DGPT doing the whole European stuff. Because eventually down the road they're going to be able to say, "Hey, we control the American market. We control the European market. Worlds really is up to us to dictate because we control the tour on both these these two places." Yeah. 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 What if they had the most perfectly curated trophy, Brody? Does that do something mm. for you as Worlds? Mm. The trophy does. The trophy does do something. Though. Yeah. Guys, I had a crazy. I had a crazy trophy. Like the idea. Stanley Cup is is legit. What if we did? What if a trophy was an entire suit of armor? 
So that's right up disc golf Ooh. alley. There's Imagine so many, having that sitting like there's like, a stood TV up and that just holds started the arms. Like uh, event is a different piece stuff. of the armor, so the goal is to win oh, all the events. Oh, you to win all the armor. Can, that that looks so good. Type crazy. stuff here. Oh man! Yeah, man. Imagine, <laughs> right. Justin, Imagine just, every pro tour is a is a different piece. That's the last one. The helmet. I just mm -hmm. saw the gaming thing. I don't know what game it's for, but oh, I saw apparently it like you get tokens. like the medals. Yeah, and then if you yeah, lose, that, if you lose, yours get yours gets destroyed, and then people <laughs> can people can pick the losers destroyed ones to put it in their trophy. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a wild. That was a wild was trophy crazy. presentation. <laughs> Controversial Anyways. event. No opinion for me. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Enough about I it. thought it was an interesting <laughs> trophy that you can like take your other people's. No, no, no. Yeah, that, that idea is yeah, cool. Yes. Well, it, like, I'm gonna, yes. yeah, I'm gonna make sure your broken trophy is in my trophy. In my trophy. That's <laughs> that is hilarious. That is pretty cool. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, I can't hear you. You're, I can't hear you all the way from your broken trophy. <laughs> like, that's, that's pretty tough. Um, Trevor, right. Trevor Shark is gonna get melted down now and given a hunter in a different form. Might be. Yeah, might have to be. Um, no, he'll never get it. <laughs> All right, on to the final topic here. This one, actually speaking of melted plastic and, and such things, this is going to be an interesting one. So really curious to hear your takes on this. Latitude 64 recently announced via their social media that they have a patent pending for a new disc manufacturing process that will allow them to combine the benefits of stiff rimmed discs with a grippy feel. They're almost describing it as a skin. Um, Jeff Panis from Innova made a post soon after on the Innova Wombat account that didn't directly make any accusations, uh, but seemed to be a, we did this first, but just didn't release it type of post. There was definitely that tone um, in the post and especially with the timing. So my question is, is it a good thing if disc manufacturers can patent in this kind of technology even when others may have already achieved it um, and also would it more legal disputes over these issues drive disc innovation forward or halt it due to singular companies holding on to technology when others are more capable of utilizing it so we don't always talk about this disc manufacturing and disc companies like this but anytime something happens in the innovation of discs i have to talk about it because i just i'm i'm dying for it i need it um gary would you like to go first or second i'll go first on this one all right take it away uh, this is a really exciting question for me because I get to put my business hat on. Uh, there's been a long-standing debate over the years about how patents and innovation kind of work with each other. And some people believe that that patents squash new ideas and keep things in the hands of the powerful people. And part of that's because back in the 1950s, there was this guy named Jerome Lemelson, and he created this idea called submarine patents, where what he would do is he'd start a patent process and uh, he'd halt it in the actual application and he would do this. He'd follow a ton of these in the medical landscape, wait for large companies to finish the pat finish their, their product or their, their um, thing. And then he would finish the patent, demand royalty streams from them, and he'd make millions of dollars. And people followed mm -hmm. suit for that. And it really, really, you know, hurt patents across the board. So then there are other people who say that patents force competitors to think outside the box because you have to strive for greater innovation than you would ever normally have. I think there are merits to both sides of the debate there, but one thing is pretty clear to me. If you want to file a patent, that can definitely help secure your ideas. Even if somebody else had them first, if you were the one who filed the patent, you could secure your ideas. But there's some risk there because patents create disclosure, and you have to disclose a lot of times like your secret formulas, your manufacturing techniques. So companies try to avoid that sometimes because they don't want to overshare their information. Uh, I'm not so certain that's a large of a concern in disc golf at the moment, but the big key for companies like Innova or Clash with their tone technology is in the finer details of the wording of the patent. The Latitude patent specifically says, central plate portion includes a core of a first polymer based material and at least in the region of the rim a second polymer based material that is chemically bonded to the first and forms an outer surface of the disc there's a lot of wiggle room in there to be different and as long as other companies are doing that they can still operate in the same space with little nuanced differences and i think this could be the start of patents and disc golf this is this work and go because for better or worse it's going to provide uh be very successful for companies and crippling for others as they get locked out of markets but guys it's 2024 conglomerates are forming patents are coming this is typical for the growth of any major sport buckle up all right big disc golf buckle up says gary um dustin what do you think about this patent situation yeah i mean it really depends on like who do you mean it's good for as a disc manufacturer it makes huge business sense that if you patent a new technology uh, that you can innovate in order to own the market share if in fact that is a huge step forward in this technology then of course it very much behooves you to try to hold on to that but 
I do have to wonder a little bit about, well, how far can you innovate and how good can you make something before it just doesn't get PDGA approved? And so you can't really do it anyway because there's some type of ruling that really stops you from doing that, right? Like we already see this happen where you can't really make the rim any wider than the PDGA currently allows it to be because it's going to be considered not fair. Same with weight, same with, you know, materials and other dimensions. So like it does kind of still teeter on PDGA approval, whether or not you really can even get off the ground. Now, obviously lawsuits, litigation over patents can stifle innovation because if your new tech builds off an existing idea and just kind of adds to it and somebody already owns that, you know, foundational piece, you're basically SOL. And so look what happened here. Gateway Disports owned the first ever Overmold back in 2006. They are currently now, I don't think at least really pushing any type of overmold disc in any of the discs that they put out today. But had they have patented the overmold, then they could have just made it to where MVP could never exist because they didn't start doing it until 2009. And so you get my point. And, and if MVP would have somehow gotten some type of patent to work about having like a separate rim or something like that, all of a sudden, you know, Latitude 264 doesn't get to make their, you know, overmolded dish that they made in 2017, or you don't see Clash being able to do what they're doing with Tone because maybe MVP makes an argument, hey, you're, you're, you're putting something as kind of an overmold, even though it's on the underside, like it's still kind of in our range. So it definitely could indeed cause a problem. Uh, so in the end, I think legal threats could indeed, you know, ruin innovation for disc golf as new tech is building off of maybe older tech and things of that nature. But yeah, if you're a manufacturer, you'd love to corner the market on something huge, especially if you could argue it gives the people who are buying your disc an edge over others and somehow it slips through PDGA approval, then heck yeah, man. If I'm a disc company and I find that golden ticket, then you better believe I want to hold on to it. Yeah, really good points, guys. That's That was, you guys had your research. That was great. Um, I will say the what's interesting uh, with this is obviously the language in these patents is what becomes the the war essentially. And I've heard of some earlier patents in disc golf because I believe way back when there was a dispute between Innova and Gateway over disc patents when when the discs were first arriving on market and just the idea of a beveled edge disc was new. But we're going to learn something really interesting um, potentially with this one, um, depending on how how Latitude wants to it enforce sounds like it. It sounds like Latitude's trying to do overmold, but chemically bonded instead of having like two separate molds just being put together. Yeah, and so again, that's technically Overtop. it's going to be kind of an overmold, but not right. in the same way that MVP has two separate pieces. Well, we're, yeah, so, we're yeah. we're going to figure. Obviously, Latitude, there's a reason they wanted to patent this. You know, they believe mm -hmm. by filing that patent, they are going to be protecting something. Uh, because you wouldn't, obviously, like Gary mentioned, you wouldn't want to just disclose things for the sake of it. They want to protect something. They're going to enforce it. You would think so. Mm -hmm. Who does the, who do they attack? You know, who do they feel like they have things? Are, are there products already on the market that they feel like can't be there because of what they have? Is tone technology not allowed? You know, how far does this go? Or are they just kind of trying to get ahead of everybody and pushing out future products? It's going to be really, really interesting to watch. And uh, yeah, it's and you mentioned another interesting thing, Dustin, too, with the PDGA requirements. You know, I'd love to know wipe away all the PDGA requirements, get rid of every single one of them. And what do it, what does a disc manufacturer come up with? What would they actually do if there were no limits, if they had everything at their uh, disposal? I just, I'd just be mm -hmm. curious to know if they're, how far away they are from that product um, as they could imagine it. But yeah, I think we're in for a very interesting landscape and seeing a company make a move like that. Um, it's going to be fascinating. It I makes know me that... just wonder what more can you do to disc at this point? Yeah. I mean, like yeah, I do exactly. almost feel like we've kind of yep. like, yeah, exactly. you can find maybe new materials that yep. like with the whole fission thing that MVP is doing with totally. like lightweight inner heavier outer, like kind of thing. Yeah. Like I, well, I just, I would love to know what the heck a ching. Well, this is coming back with the dimples. Yeah. Saw that well, Scott Stokely, well, so I, I don't know. I think there's something to the dimple technology, but if you look at the golf ball, for example, you know, the golf ball has evolved a lot over the years, um, actually gotten so good now that they want to roll it back. Um, but you know, there's, there gets to a point where you get to the top premium, the pro V one golf ball, you get to a point in its evolution to where now anything they're marketing is mm, it's, it's marketing, you know, at the end of the yeah. day, those golf balls are what they are. Um, they're finding more somewhat interesting things with the golf clubs, but like if you look at the golf ball, that's just where it's gotten. So you do wonder like, where does disc golf on that journey? I think there's probably more to be yeah. explored. I hope there is plenty more, but we'll find out. We're going to see. I mean, can you just imagine if we got to see latitude 64 V Innova in the courts? Like, I mean, goodness gracious, the Ooh. media would be unreal. Disc golf dot laws sal salivating at that right now. Yeah. I mean, oh, oh my God. Like, I, I think I would probably shed a tear if I open up my Twitter to see that. On the, next, 
The next innovation should be taking those stickers and and bedding that stuff in the plastic. So we could we could cut down thirty minutes of the pro uh, of pro mm. tour rounds right there, and on we could disc, just find yeah. the disc in a half a second. Well, yeah. Imagine the pro tracer technology if all the discs had trackers in it. Something to mm -hmm. think about. Something to think about. All right. Well, great show there. Great, great final round there. Gary just having the slight edge. Had a lead coming in though. Um, back on top. What do you have to say, Gary? You know, I'm more excited than ever at the landscape of where disc golf is going. It seems like every single week we've got more good things to say about FPO, which is getting stronger as a field. I think about that a couple of years ago. We see the European market getting getting more and more expansive. We're seeing new young names come into MPO. And I just I am so excited to be living through this time in disc golf. And um, I can't wait to tell stories about all these things happening to like my son and their friends and all the people when I get older. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun, and you know, twenty years from now, when the pro tour is dissolved and we're watching the Saudi disc golf tour, um, we'll get to talk about it. It'll be a great time. So um, uh, I'm just happy. Hey, I'm just happy I made it through uh, fighting some stuff over here, really battling, um, and uh, just want to say that <laughs> I'm an absolute warrior for not DNFing and not showing up. Uh, if I say I'm going to be there, I will be yeah. there. So just absolute battle today. That's right. That does Absolutely. look tough. I'm so sorry about that. Go Gators. All right. Um, if you want to submit a topic to be on next episode of debate night, you can scan the QR code here on the screen. We had two more fan submitted topics. You guys are really starting rolling in with them. Your, your hit percentage is getting higher. I think you guys are starting to dial in what we like to talk about in the show. And that's great. It helps me out a lot um, when planning the show. So make sure to keep submitting those. You can click a link in the description. If you want to get access to that, throw anything against the wall, maybe it'll stick. You never know. You might Ask just get about to hear drama. Brody Smith. Ask about drama. You might just get to hear Barry Smith tear your question down live on air. Or maybe, and I know he will, if there's a good question, he'll tell you it's a good question. Oh, yeah, I will. Dark Horse question of the year. Dark Horse question yeah. of the year is still up for grippy. grabs. Yeah. Could be a grippy award. Anyways, we'll see you next episode. Thanks for watching.